Hi, I'm Scott Bowler, director of the Johnson Center for Political Economy here at Troy University and host of eConversation. Over our next couple of episodes, we're going to talk about uh, the size of the federal government, how it's gotten so big, and what can be done about it. Uh, tonight, our guest is uh, one of my colleagues in the Johnson Center for Political Economy, Dan Sutter. Uh, Ms. Dr. Sutter is the Charles Koch Professor of Economics uh, at Troy University and an expert in the field of public choice economics. Public choice economics looks at um, politicians and government actors uh, and tries to look at them through the economic lens and uh, make sense out of their behavior. So it's great to have him on the show tonight uh, talking about what, federal, what the federal government spends money on, where that money comes from, um, and what deficits and debts mean uh, for us currently and as we go forward into the future. So Dr. Sutter, great to have you. Thank you. Um, let's get right into uh, the questions. Um, what is the federal government spending money on? What are the big areas of spending? Well, right now, federal spending is uh, just under about $4 trillion a year. And the biggest components of, of federal spending are the five the largest areas. And they would be uh, Social Security, uh, Medicare, uh, Medicaid, defense spending, and then interest on the national debt, the, the amount of money that we currently owe uh, other uh, uh, people. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I call the, the first three that you mentioned, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, the big three. Um, three really big entitlement programs uh, that are eating up a large uh, share of our budget. Um, when you, you talk to most people, um, they aren't aware just how big those programs are. They'll say things instead that you know welfare and foreign aid are the big areas of expenditure. That's just not true. Um, the, the, the big three dwarf that? Right, yes, it, it's, it's very clear that, uh, you know, uh, international you know, assistance and uh, you know, corporate welfare type spending are very small compared to the in entitlement programs. They they dominate, and I think as we can see, uh, we have a slide to, to show mm -hmm. this. Um, <coughs> they're they're the largest component of uh, federal spending now. They're projected to get just get worse into the into the future. Now it's kind of interesting as to why people don't perceive these programs to be so expensive. I think in part because uh, people like to think that they're not really part of the Washington spending problem. It's nice to blame the problem on, on Washington and thus spending on other people. And so things like uh, foreign aid or welfare spending are, are things that the average person can point to and think, well, they're not benefiting mm -hmm. from that and they're, they're not responsible for that. So that must be the problem. Things like Social Security and, and Medicare that are uh, either most, many Americans either now are beneficiaries of or will be at some point in their lifetimes. We don't want to think that we're responsible for those, uh, for the, our spending problems. And so maybe that's perhaps why they overlook the, the, their contribution, mm -hmm. the contribution of these uh, favorite programs to, to the spending problem. We, we have some charts that we're going to show um, viewers tonight. And um, the first one that we're going to look at is from the, these all are from the Heritage Foundation. They come from the Congressional Budget Office data, though. So it's, it's yeah. independent uh, data, perhaps the best data that we could get in terms of um, what, where the expenditures are going, um, how much is out there. It's, it's reliable, credible data. And when we look at this first chart, which is right behind us, uh, we see that entitlements are 2.4 trillion. Is that this year? Uh, yes, it's a, like 2011 spending. Okay. So it's 2011 spending. And, and remember, uh, total federal spending is just under uh, 4 trillion. So you can see that's over half of what we're spending on, on is these uh, three Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security programs. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they represent the, the largest share of, of what the federal government is spending on. And, and by comparison, you can see that some of the, the ones that get a lot of uh, attention, like foreign aid or, or NASA or, or uh, public broadcasting, which we sometimes still hear debates about, uh, whether we want to spend money on that or not is a def different issue. But you yeah. can see that's like $500 million. So it's, that's just the tiniest little drop mm -hmm. in the bucket uh, compared to the uh, entitlement spending. Yeah. Um, when we talk about um, how we've gotten to this point and we look at both discretionary spending and entitlement spending uh, over time, um, has it just been an onward and upward trajectory to some extent? These programs have just gotten bigger and bigger um, you know, over the last 30 or 40 years. It over the last uh, 
40 years or so, we've particularly seen an, uh, a large increase in entitlement spending. Mm -hmm. uh, entitlement spending was about 2.5% of gross domestic product back in 1965, and it's now about 10% of gross domestic product. So it's quadrupled relative to the size of the economy. Uh, defense spending has gone up or down uh, from year to year, depending on you know when we were fighting the Vietnam War or during the, the 1980s defense buildup. Uh, but defense spending has maintained relative uh, constancy relative to, to GDP and is in fact a little bit lower now than it mm -hmm. was in, in the 1980s. It, the, the real growth of government spending over the last 40 years or so has been in these in entitlement programs. Mm -hmm. First Social Security, now in, in more recent uh, decades, uh, the Medicare program. Mm -hmm. And here we have another chart uh, from Heritage just looking at Medicare spending um, and it, what it's doing as a share of um, uh, as a share of the budget when we go out in time. Can you explain to um, viewers this chart? Right, yeah. So this uh, this shows what's projected to happen over the next uh, 40 years in the absence of any uh, major changes in the entitlement programs. Um, Social Security and uh, Medicaid are, are both projected to increase some. Social Security rather modestly, did, despite the number of uh, increase in, in retirements with the baby boom coming up. And uh, Medicare, uh, Medicaid some, but the big driver here, the one that's really uh, affecting a lot of public budget discussions now and then in especially into the future is the Medicare program, both because of the rate of spending per patient in, in recent years has been growing so fast. And then with the retirement of the baby boom, mm -hmm. as these in individuals start to be, uh, be covered under Medicare. Uh, that, that's why Medicare is expected to you know, at least double in, in terms of the percentage of, of GDP. And you know, with s Social Security spending and Medicaid spending not going down, in fact, in increasing, uh, we can see that you know, by the time you, you get out there to 2050, uh, Medicare spending is going to be equal to all of the other spending other than a, a, on a interest on the national debt mm -hmm. by, by 2050 if something isn't done to, to change the entitlement programs. So. <laughs> is that re realistic? I mean, can we have Medicare the way that we have it today, um, <laughs> going out to 2050, you know, where you're covered at 65 and essentially all of your medical bills, uh, you mm -hmm. pay very small premiums and you're covered until death after 65? Uh, is that a system you can imagine being sustained? It doesn't seem like it, it, it could be sustained. I mean, the, the you know, recent spending, the combination of the recent spending increases, if you project them to continue to uh, occur in the future, along with the increasing numbers of, of Americans who are going to be covered under the, the Medicare program, uh, it just isn't going to be sustainable. So at some point in time, we're going to have to make some kind of change to try to, to uh, control this spending. Mm -hmm. People often, when they're talking about spending and controlling spending, don't touch the big three, Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid. It's, it's a hot potato politically. Mm -hmm. um, you, you just don't want to go near that, it seems, if you're a politician. George W. Bush talked about um, you know, privatizing Social Security a tiny little bit when he was in office, and that went nowhere. He said he had all of this political capital, uh, but it didn't translate into any meaningful reform. Mm -hmm. Uh, President Obama really hasn't touched any of the big programs because I think politically it's it's a real bad idea. So all of the action seems to be um, in the discretionary spending area. If we can slash discretionary spending and focus on that, maybe it'll offset all of this growth in the big three. Um, can can we move forward just addressing discretionary spending? Um, I, it, it doesn't seem how you possible that you could uh, actually mm -hmm. do that. I mean, without cutting discretionary spending to such low levels that seem completely impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as you can see this uh, diagram we have mm -hmm. here, if you look at, this shows the growth of um, discretionary uh, spending. So that's the part of the budget that Congress actually approves every year. And then the mandatory spending or the entitlement spending, the things that we have to uh, spend money on. And you can see that over the last uh, 30 or 40 years, what's really grown there is this uh, mandatory spending. And it's now larger than the discretionary spending. Mm -hmm. So when we have debates over passing a budget or, or cutting spending, and it's all focused on discretionary spending, the type of uh, the what's covered in Congress's annual budget, I mean, we're really covering less than half of federal spending. And if, if we wanted to cut you know, government spending, and we were going to cut just uh, discretionary spending. The, the cuts would have to be extremely steep, and 
um, politically it just doesn't seem that that's going to be possible. For our viewers um, who aren't familiar with this jargon, mandatory spending are things that the government is required to continue, continue funding at a particular level um, indefinitely, right? And discretionary spending are things like roads and education, um, and things that, that can go up or down um, at the discretion of Congress. Right, right. So the way the entitlement programs work, they, the programs have formulas and, and uh, anybody who's, who qualifies for in the levels of payments are, are set by these formulas mm -hmm. and anybody who qualifies under these formulas then uh, is, gets this, the spending. And then there's also interest on the debt which, mm -hmm. which is a, a mandatory spending. Yeah. But the entitlement spending then is off budget in the sense that these programs have already been set up under these rules and anybody who qualifies or whatever the level of spending ends up being based on the, the, the rules of the program that spending has to occur sort of more or less automatically. You mentioned um, interest on the debt and I want to make sure we spend some time talking about deficits and debt. Mm -hmm. um, deficits occur whenever um, spending exceeds the revenue that comes in and I, I seem to remember seeing that this past year we ran like over a one trillion dollar deficit and that's been the pattern the last few years since the financial crisis. Um, these then get compounded onto our debt, which is around, I think, 14 trillion or something like that. It's, it's a pretty big number. Um, do these matter? Why, why, um, why, do, why are people worried about deficits? And you know, should we be worried about them? Right, I think certainly uh, we are at a level of debt to GDP in the United States now. Our debt to GDP is around 90%. Mm -hmm. uh, so the debt is the total amount that the U.S. Uh, government owes and then the GDP is the size of our economy. Mm -hmm. And so our, our total debt is almost equal to the uh, current GDP. Okay. And that's often historically in other nations a, a critical threshold as debt gets above current GDP. Uh, it gets hard to control spending. A, a, big, a big reason why you end up having fiscal problems with that is so much money ends up being spent on interest. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a, a chart mm -hmm. here to illustrate that the current level of interest spending uh, in the United States relative to some other uh, US major government departments. So we see that we're spending about two-thirds on interest of what we spend on the Defense Department. So a lot of people you know, point to the Defense Department and uh, gov uh, how much we're spending on defense. We're spending all that, mu almost that much on interest now. Mm -hmm. And that's with interest rates at exceptionally low levels. Yeah. And so it, uh, in interest payments now might be manageable, but with so much debt, we really put ourselves, I think as you can see in our next slide here, mm -hmm. we really put ourselves in the future in a, a very dangerous and precarious position where the interest payments could es uh, escalate. And they're projected to escalate anyway because we're in the near future, it certainly looks like we're going to be running substantial deficits and adding this to the uh, total national debt. Mm -hmm. But if, you know, interest rates are unlikely to stay at their current uh, historically low levels okay. and they can and if they start to increase and we have all of this debt out there then uh, then we're really going to be uh, really tied into making these huge huge and escalating interest payments and the interest payments could easily escalate at a rate which could you know even dwarf the, the growth of, of Medicare potentially. Uh, so you know, Medicare is a big problem, but we mm -hmm. can see that uh, interest payments could grow to such an extent that they could really dwarf uh, what we're spending on Medicaid. Medicare here's, here's the next chart you mentioned, and I think this is um, picking up on the growth in interest payments over time. So as the debt grows, um, just like in any household, right, if, you're, if you become heavily indebted, right. the interest payments on all of that debt are going to explode. Uh, and this is, this is the projection. Right. Um, so this is the projection going forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see that you know, they're easily expected to double by uh -huh. the time we get just over the next 10 years. Uh, and they, they, again, that's a combination of the uh, the additional debt that we're going to have with deficits in the next uh, several years, over the next decade, plus the, the fact that interest rates are likely to rise. And then you get in, making these projections are uh, somewhat problematic and then you can really get into trouble if people, if people, investors internationally begin to be very concerned about whether the United States debt is sound or not. Mm -hmm. We saw that this summer with the uh, the reduction of the credit rating by Standard and Poor's. Um, at this point in time, U.S. Uh, tr debt still is a 
perceived by investors as a very safe investment. But if that starts to change in the future, and as we continue to run larger deficits, then we will be getting up to this threshold where other nations have had problems servicing their, their debt. Mm -hmm. Then the interest payments could even skyrocket compared to what's uh, projected here into the future. Is there any period um, in US recent US history that's comparable to the present in terms of these really big um, uh, debt burdens relative to income? Have we ever been up around 100% before? Back at the end of World War II, okay. uh, we were at a somewhat similar his historical level. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, uh, you know, the US's uh, financial position looked much stronger going yeah. forward there than it does now because everybody recognized we were spending a huge amount of money on, on national defense and with the war over mm -hmm. that that amount was going to be Easy reduced to drastically yeah. and, and so with the huge reductions in defense spending they were projected not to start balancing the budget which we did and we started running small surpluses a after World War II and then with a, uh, a growing economy, they, that uh, debt to GDP ratio shrank very, very quickly. So there was, we have been in a similar situation in the past, you know, perhaps with the numbers, but the situation going forward looked so much different than it does now. Mm -hmm. I mean, by almost every projection, we we're expected to have, run big deficits out for the next decade. Mm -hmm. Back at the end of World War II, it was pretty clear that we were going to start balancing the, the budget every year after we reduced defense spending. Let's um, turn to, we've talked about spending, we've talked about deficits and debt. Um, I want to spend a little time before uh, we wrap up on revenues and taxes, where, our, where, where the money comes from to fund the federal government. Um, in the recent policy discussion, uh, Democrats have been pointing at Republicans and saying we need to address revenue. And mm -hmm. uh, what they mean by that uh, to a significant extent is we just need to raise some taxes. Uh, Warren Buffett has come out with the idea of the millionaire tax. If you make more than a million dollars, you should pay higher taxes. And he thinks that even he should pay higher taxes um, and that there are all kinds of distortions in the tax code. To what extent can just, you know, um, improving the tax code and maybe raising taxes fix some of these problems? If we just raise revenue, we won't have deficits, right? Well. That certainly seems like it should be the case. And, and you know, obviously, if you increase revenue and nothing happens to spending, mm -hmm. you would be able to uh, reduce the deficit. But historically, both in the United States, when you look at states, US experience, and also international experience, it, it just never seems to work out that way. Mm -hmm. And it, we, we see when we look in the past that spending or revenue increases have led to uh, increased spending. Uh, in, in part, this is due to the budgetary process. You know, that when rev I think that when uh, legislators know that there's new revenues coming in in the future, they think when they're proposing new spending or, or increased spending, they think, well, we've got this new revenue coming and we'll just spend that. But you end up with two or three different committees in Congress spending that same revenue. I, mean, I think we see that in our own lives. When you, you know you're going to be getting a, a gift or you're, you're going to get earn some extra money, you might end up deciding to buy a new television and get some repairs on your car. And pretty soon you've spent your bonus money three times over. And that's pretty much seemingly what, what happens in the political system. The rev new revenues are there and you just, the, the, the lure to try and spend it for different uh, purposes is so strong that the, the revenues get spent. Mm -hmm. or, and so you don't end up, you never actually observe in practice this thing where revenues go up and spending doesn't go up. Mm -hmm. so. We have a couple of slides here. Uh, this one is picking up on where the federal government gets its money from. Um, a lot of the discussion in policy debates right now is over the income tax and whether mm -hmm. that should be um, flattened out, um, whether there should be less categories, whether we should tighten up on some of the deductions that you can take with respect to, say, your mortgage interest and things like that. Um, here, it looks to me like um, a lot of it's coming from payroll taxes and from individual income taxes right. as yes. well. By okay. far, the, the U.S. Uh, federal government's two largest sources of, of revenues are the uh, federal income tax and then the payroll taxes, the Social Security and Medicare Medicaid taxes. Mm -hmm that are deducted from our paychecks every week or okay. every month. And so uh, right now, individual taxes, uh, individual 
income tax is slightly more than the payroll tax. They're an approximate equal. Uh, the, the individual income tax, the federal income tax revenues, tend to be highly cyclical. So with the economy somewhat down now, uh, the income revenues are, are somewhat down. Mm -hmm. they, they will increase quickly when the economy starts picking up due to our progressive income tax. And so uh, with a, a progressive income tax system, revenues tend to be uh, highly cyclical and, and they will move with the economy. And so right now, the, they're in a bra about uh, approximate equality between the income tax and the payroll taxes. Okay. Yeah, when you look at this um, and you just kind of quickly add up the billions there, you can see why we have a deficit. You have an individual um, component that's about 900 billion, payroll, uh, call it 900 billion, a few small categories, but it, it really adds up to a little over two trillion, two and a half trillion, right. but we're spending four trillion. The difference right. there is, is your deficit. Then. Right, yeah, yeah, so about the one in 1.4 trillion deficit okay. comes in there. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, John Allison was on the show last week, um, and then he gave a talk that evening, and one of his big ideas was that we simplify the tax code, get rid of most of it, and make it just a couple of pages, make um, it a flat tax. You know, he didn't, he didn't spell out what percentage it should be, but make it flat, make it a fair tax, perhaps, mm -hmm. so that it's based on consumption. Um, could that, you know, just in, in and of itself, um, remedy some of our problems in encouraging growth and uh, possibly cutting down on deficits? It, it certainly could because mm -hmm. uh, estimates that economists have made of, of compliance costs, the cost of complying with the, uh, especially the federal income tax mm -hmm. and, and corporate taxes as well, uh, but the federal income tax, the, the, in addition to the revenue that we see that the federal income tax raises uh, approximately 5% at least a, a, of there's an additional 5% tax er, burden on there of collecting the, the, the revenues in terms of the cost of the government of collecting uh, revenues and then the cost of taxpayers. Uh, when you have pay somebody to do your taxes, all the extra records you have to keep. And so that's an, a pretty significant burden. And then on um, larger scale, when you see people or businesses having to make, you know, when they make decisions uh, about how they're going to spend money, what they're going to do, and businesses or how they're going to invest, based more on tax concerns than business concerns, then almost by definition, that's going to be hurting our economy because businesses aren't worried necessarily about what's the most profitable in terms of serving customers and producing new products, but what's going to be most profitable for them given the tax code and given the incentives that they face in the economy. And those types of things are you know perhaps probably dwarf the five percent that we you know, the five percent uh, compliance costs that we observe, and just in terms of of distorting investment, distorting decisions, and uh, create and lowering growth in the economy. I think we have one more chart here, and this is um, talking about total revenue and uh, where total revenues come from. It's kind of summarizing what we saw in uh, in the last chart. There's our mm -hmm. two point one five trillion in total revenue. What's going on with those dips near the um, very far right of the total revenue curve? Is that, is that when the economy turns down? Yes. So okay. that's the, the, when I mentioned the cyclical nature of, of federal revenues, you see a lot of that's coming from the individual income taxes in the second line that uh, when the economy drops, then income tax collections will, will drop proportion, you know, proportionally, actually a little bit more than proportionally. And so. Uh, and then you see right before that, another way of thinking of it is that there's a big burst in uh, income tax revenues that you see when the economy's booming. Mm -hmm. and, and so then we go back to a more normal uh, case when the, the recession hits. And so there is some cyclicality in, in the income taxes. And what you can also see here is that a lot of discussion has been on corporate taxes yeah. uh, in, in recent months. Uh, when, you know, whether the U.S. should raise corporate uh, taxes on corporations or not. But we see that corporate taxes uh, actually raise very little revenue compared to individual income taxes or the payroll tax. Even though the United States has uh, on the books a very high, in, by international comparisons, corporate tax rate. You know, the problem is, again, there are so many tax breaks in the ta corporate tax code that many corporations pay very little in taxes. Right. But we have on the books a very high corporate tax rate, and that ends up you know, 
that ends up being very counterproductive for growth because businesses that can't get those tax breaks end up being burdened with high taxes. You know, politically favored businesses or businesses who can do things to make sure that they get tax breaks end up not paying that much in corporate taxes. We have a few minutes left. Um, I want to ask you just a couple of um, big picture questions. Um, first, you know, uh, when you look into your crystal ball and look out into the future at the fiscal picture of America, is there any hope of us getting back on track in terms of, say, budgets being balanced, the debt coming down like it did after World War II? Um, what do you, and what do you make of um, some of these austerity discussions? The, the Tea Party um, kind of rallying and insisting that you know government spending be kind of tightened up. Um, mm -hmm. The you know the the tension in Washington D.C. the polarization, which is creating gridlock and making it difficult to pass any kind of expenditures. Um, are those healthy signs that maybe um, things are going to get better, or is the trajectory just for greater and greater fiscal deterioration, much like Europe? I think in the medium term, like say the next five to 10 years, the, we might be in a, a decent situation fiscally because I, I do think that with the, uh, the representatives elected by the Tea Party and, and the, the way the Tea Party's affected the Republican Party and uh, the, the, the fiscal uh, hawks that we now have in, in Congress and the gridlock uh, that I think, as you mentioned, is just gonna be there, there will not be a lot of new spending initiatives over the next few years. And if the economy does start to rebound, and we've seen you know, in the previous slides that tax revenues are, are, will increase a lot when the economy starts picking up again. And basically, I mean, that was the formula for balancing the budget back in the 1990s uh, under Clinton and, and the Republican Congress, that they wouldn't let each other spend money on stuff that they wanted to spend money on, and through gridlock or, or stalemate, uh, expenditures or spending didn't actually increase very much as the economy boomed and we had all these revenues flow in and we were within just a few years able to go from you know, our traditional uh, deficit situation to balancing the budget and actually running a surplus and you know it's hard to remember hard to recall but about 11 years ago we started had discussions about what we were going to do with this yeah. permanent surplus that we, we seem to be running in Washington. And so I think over the next five to 10 years, those, those factors look pretty uh, favorable. But in the longer term, what we saw with entitlements earlier, the, the, the aging of the population and the increase and um, increasing medical expenses that are gonna fall under Medicare, those start to become more of a, a factor, I think, in the, the, the really long term, once we get past uh, about 10 years or so. And those numbers look so bad going out into the, the future that um, we're certainly going to have some rough budget years ahead, you know, perhaps 10 years down the line, if not uh, or more before that. I want to thank you for uh, joining us today. It's really been a pleasure having you. Uh, next week uh, on our show, we're going to talk about why the government has gotten so big. So you've gone over the numbers of the big federal government, um, and our guest next week will uh, try to explain some of the theories behind why there's been so much uh, government growth. In the year 1900, I wanna say government spending was maybe three or 4% of gross domestic product, and now it's up in the, the, the 20s, uh, which is a pretty big uh, and significant growth. Uh, I also wanna thank viewers for tuning in. Um, please uh, tune in next week uh, to another show of eConversations. Thank you.